Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Who are those formative leaders in your own life? Those whose lives you need to emulate, whose faith you need to imitate. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, Jonathan, as you know, you asked that question, there are a couple of people that popped to mind for me. Is there anyone that, as you think about that, that comes to mind for you? Oh, I think I can think of a number of people, probably. Um, I can think of pastors in churches where I've had a privilege to be to be part, be a member. Some who, I can think of one who's gone to glory. I can think of a couple who are still al- alive. And it's, it's one thing to hear someone's words and to hear their teaching, which is, which is wonderful. But it's another thing to have the privilege of seeing something of how they live, knowing them a little bit personally. And those models are so precious to us, and we'll all have them in the Christian life. And to see someone who's lived with integrity and who has walked as they have talked, we need those people, and we need to pay attention to their way of life. Uh, and seek to learn from it. The Lord gives us those people as gifts. He really does. And we're going to continue to look at this topic of true worship and leadership today. So if you can, I hope you'll grab your Bible and open it to the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 13. As we continue our message, here is Jonathan. I believe it was the leadership guru, John Maxwell, who famously declared that everything rises and falls on leadership. The point can perhaps be overstretched a little, but I think we all recognize the importance of leadership in every realm of life. And of course, as it is true in every realm of life, it is true in the life of the church. And I believe as we look to the scriptures, we find that God designed it that way. Leadership within the church is an important part of God's design for the church. And it's therefore no great surprise that this great epistle to the Hebrews closes with a particular focus on leadership within the church and then our engagement with our leaders in the life of the church. Those who have spent years and decades involved in church life and who have had experience of different churches in different seasons in different places will know right away that a church that is flourishing and healthy will be a church where there is a happy and healthy dynamic between congregation and leadership. And those with some experience of church life will know as well that a church in trouble will be a church where that dynamic is not functioning so well. I'm very grateful for the evidence we see of the Lord's blessing in this aspect of our church's life, and I think the Lord has been kind to us in that. But there is no doubt that this is a very important theme for us to consider, and there is much here for us to learn. The broader focus, the bigger theme of Hebrews chapter 13 is, of course, the theme of true worship. What does it look like to worship the God of heaven appropriately and rightly as his people? You'll remember that in chapter 12, the writer took us to the very courts of heaven above, at least by faith, and he pointed our eyes to the eternal God. He he reminded us that the God of Zion above will, will bring this present world to an end by a great act of judgment, a great act of of shaking. And knowing all this, the writer called us to make a simple but a vital response to this God of heaven above. Chapter 12 and verse 28, the writer says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Well, chapter 13 is given to us then to tell us how it is that we may worship this God above as the grand finale to the great salvation truths that Hebrews has taught us, this chapter is given to teach us how to respond to this saving God in true worship. 
And to our great surprise, the worshipful response that God calls for here, it's not reduced to our, our Sunday morning experience. No, it encompasses the whole of our life lived in his presence. Last week, we saw how we are to worship God by loving one another in some very concrete ways. In verse 7, at the start of the section we're considering today, the, the focus shifts slightly, but not radically. It's not a radical shift. It focuses, it turns now to a focus on our, our leaders. This is still a matter of brotherly love, verse 1. We're still very much in that same territory. But in broad terms, we, we worship God by loving our brothers and sisters well. But now the focus is particularly on our attitude and our response to those who are leaders within the church. The fact that this monumental letter closes with a specific focus on leaders and how we re relate to our leaders, it reminds us just how much leadership within the Christian church actually matters. You know, sometimes I, I think we can privatize our faith to such a degree, to such an extent that we think, you know, it's basically just about me and the Lord and no one else matters all that much in my own faith journey. I, I can kind of go it alone. If it so happens that a, a church leader can provide some, you know, some good Bible teaching or some good counseling, if, if it happens that a product on the Christian media marketplace suits me well, I will access that, I will receive that as a consumer, but the relationship of care, of accountability, of prayer with specific leaders, that can interest us less, I think. But here, it's clearly vital vital to our Christian life, vital to our worship of God. And, and there are three ways here that the writer calls us to respond to the leaders that God has put in place in his church. Let me mention them now just in outline, and then we're going to walk through them together. As part of our worship of God, we are to remember our leaders, verse 7. We are to obey our leaders, verse 17. And we are to pray for our leaders, verse 17. 18. Well, let's start with the first of those. Remember your leaders, verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Here in verse 7, you'll have noticed the focus is not on our leaders today, our contemporary leaders within the church. No, the focus here is actually on our former leaders, leaders who impacted our lives in days gone by, leaders perhaps who have now gone on to glory, gone to be with the Lord in heaven. The writer calls us to remember the leaders who spoke God's word to us, perhaps for that very first time. We're to give careful thought to the way in which they lived, careful thought to their Christian witness. We are to imitate their faith. I think we often pay actually too little attention to the power of example, the power of good models in the Christian life. But you see, Hebrews is very, very interested in the power of example. In a sense, all the great heroes of faith from chapter 11 that we study together, they were given to us to provide examples for us in how to live the life of faith. But now we're encouraged to look to significant Christian leaders in our own lives, in our own experience, leaders whose influence was formative to us. And we're to give careful thought to them and to their lives. I actually think as I reflect on this that there's tremendous wisdom here. One thing I tend to notice about the Christian world at the present time is how faddish it can be, how driven by fads and trends. A new leader or a new ministry comes along with a new theological idea, a new model for ministry, a new teaching on the Christian life. It's fresh. It's fresh. It's exciting. It generates a social media buzz. Uh, there's, a, there's a podcast. There is a book. There is a soundtrack. There is a video, whatever. And the evangelical world is just kind of taken by storm. A few voices on the sidelines, on the margins, will express a little bit of concern, maybe, that, that this just doesn't quite sound biblical. This doesn't quite look biblical. It doesn't feel right somehow. 
But, you know, those voices are, are muted and they're written off as old fashioned, as stuck in the mud. And then a few years later, the leader who dazzled and who shook up the Christian world, well, that leader has some, I don't know, moral difficulty or, or teaches some more explicit heresy or just flames out of ministry in some other way. And, and people then start to look back and say, I wonder how sound that teaching was right back at the beginning after all. And then on reflection, we all start to think, you know what, I think there were signs of trouble right at the beginning. I wonder, does that sound familiar in any way? For those of us who have been observing the Christian world for a while, I think it does sound familiar, doesn't it? That story, it's often enough repeated. Fads come and go, leaders come and go, and it's easy for us to buy into the latest thing and then sometimes to be thrown off kilter and even misled by the latest thing. And Hebrews wants to anchor us. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called True Worship. I'm taking a look at Hebrews chapter 13 today, and we're pausing right here, but we'll get back to the message in just a moment. You know, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported program. If you're benefiting from listening to Jonathan's teaching, I'd love for you to consider a gift of support. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Heaven, How I Got Here. It's the story of the thief on the cross, and it's just a clear presentation of the gospel message. It's the story of the thief telling his story from heaven present day, looking back some 2,000 years to what he experienced on the cross and how he received forgiveness and salvation from Jesus. There's nothing he did to earn that gift of salvation. And he really lays out in clear terms how you can know Jesus, how you can receive his forgiveness and spend your eternity with God. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as you give a gift of any amount and support Encounter the Truth this month. You can give your gift online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884. Or again, our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you're just joining us, we are in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, looking at verses 7 to 25 today. So if you don't have a Bible open already, hope you'll join us there as we continue the message. Here is Jonathan. Fads come and go, leaders come and go, and it's easy for us to buy into the latest thing and then sometimes to be thrown off kilter and even misled by the latest thing. And Hebrews wants to anchor us. The writer has spent 12 chapters teaching us vitally important Christian doctrine, but he knows that we are sometimes visual learners. We need to see how the Christian life is lived, and we need to see how the Christian life is lived out in some very practical ways. And so he tells us, remember your former leaders who taught you the Word of God faithfully, who lived it out, and then who finished the race well. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And we might hear that and we might object, well, that worked, you know, it worked 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but the world has changed don't we need to move on and move with the times? And to that objection, the writer gives this very profound answer. I wonder if you noticed it, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The Jesus whom your former leaders served and trusted and walked with through all the days of their lives, the Jesus whom they found to be faithful in their generation, that Jesus, he is the same, always the same, yesterday and today and forever. And that means, that means that their Christian life, their faith, their way of walking with Jesus, it's not outdated. It's not old-fashioned. It's not sort of fusty. It's genuine if they finished well. And so for that reason, don't go for fads. Don't be swept away by the latest thing, verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. 
For the first readers of this letter, their danger was that they were going to be swept away by teachings that, that told them to go back to Jewish rites and rituals. These believers from a Jewish background, they were being pressured, it seems, to return to their former religious practices and to step back from their commitment to Christ and their trust in Christ. They're being pressured to return to the synagogue and the temple, to the sacrifices, to the food laws, to the purity laws, to other rules and regulations, to feasts and to festivals. But the writer says, don't be taken in by this latest wave of pressure. Don't be taken in by the latest wave of teaching. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, he says, by, by God's kindness in Jesus, by his finished work at the cross, by the help of the Holy Spirit within. It's good to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. And now the writer takes us back to the very core of the gospel. We haven't forgotten these former leaders, but the writer is grounding us now in the faith that these leaders received. Yes, it may make you a social outcast to follow these leaders of old in their simple trust in Jesus, their simple trust in a simple gospel. Yes, you may be reviled or excluded for sticking with this simple gospel. Yes, the religious community might have ostracized these readers for refusing to take part in the sacrifices of the temple and so on. But if we stick with this gospel that we receive from those leaders of old, here is what we have, verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. We have access to the altar where the sacrifice of Jesus was given. We've got access to all the benefits of Jesus as he died for us, as he died in our place. And that's the only altar we need, not, not the altar at Jerusalem. We may be rejected by those around us for sticking with the faith we received from our leaders of old, the gospel we first heard. But the writer says, we are the privileged ones. And where the writer takes us now, I think is just beautiful. He, he wants to show us now that the place of exclusion, the place of social exclusion, the place of the outcast is actually the place of privilege. Just notice where he takes us, verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. When sacrifices are offered at the temple, the bodies of the animals that are given for sin are then taken outside the community and burned. And when Jesus gave himself to be our sacrifice, he was crucified outside the city gate on a hill called Calvary. Verse 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. You see, Jesus became an exile, an outcast, one rejected by contemporary society. And it may be that in sticking with the faith of old, the faith we receive from those leaders who have gone to heaven before us, the faith that may be very unpopular today, the faith that society rejects, the faith that even the mainstream Christian world might question when the newest fad comes along, it may be that we become outcasts by doing that. But here's what the cross teaches us. The cross teaches us that the place of exclusion is actually the place of privilege, of access, of honor. Verse 13, therefore let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. There's going to be constant pressure for us to buy into the latest spiritual fad. There will be constant pressure on us actually to abandon the faith altogether. And one of the key ways that we're going to keep our head and remain steady in the days to come and the months to come and the years to come, one of the key ways we're going to do that by the grace of God, one of the key ways we'll become equipped 
to accept and even embrace being outcasts and eccentrics. It is to remember faithful leaders who have gone before us, who have held faithfully to the Word of God and who finished their Christian life well. As I reflect on all this, I do think that we need to be willing to embrace social exclusion. I think we need to be willing to be unpopular, not only among secularists who can't comprehend our belief in God, but also among the mainstream of popular religion. We need to hold doggedly to the faith that we once received, and we need to give attention to models of faith and godliness who have gone before us. I sometimes think, actually, that we should lose a little bit of our appetite for reading the newest book to come off the evangelical press, and we should spend just a little bit more time reading some old books, (laughs) some books produced by godly saints who finished their earthly race well and who have been proved faithful over time. In thinking over these verses, I was reminded of a book by an evangelical hero of the 19th century, J.C. Ryle. And in his book, entitled Old Paths, he is dealing with the very same issues that were coming up in his day. New theological trends and patterns and fads that were calling into question the essentials of evangelical faith. Just listen to this from his introduction. This book, he writes contains nothing but the old paths in which the apostolic Christians, the reformers, the best English churchmen for the last 300 years, and the best evangelical Christians of the present day have persistently walked. From these paths, I see no reason to depart. They are often sneered at and ridiculed as old-fashioned, worn out, and powerless in the 19th century, Be it so, none of these things move me. I have yet to learn that there is any system of religious teaching, by whatever name it may be called, which produces one quarter of the effect on human nature that is produced by the old, despised system of doctrine, which is commonly called evangelical. Remember your leaders those who spoke to you the Word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I wonder who are those formative leaders in your own life, those whose lives you need to emulate, whose faith you need to imitate. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a message called True Worship, really taking a look at the theme of leadership today. We're going to pause right here, but we'll continue this message next time. Hope you'll make it a point to tune in. You can always listen on the radio, or if you happen to miss that, you can also listen online. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Our website, it's EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you our regular listener to this broadcast, you know that Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported ministry, and that's exactly what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity to stay on this station. But as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Heaven, How I Got Here. It's the story of the thief on the cross. And Jonathan, I think this is a great book to show us that you know, salvation and entrance into heaven is entirely because of Jesus. Well, that's exactly right, and it's one of the reasons we're thrilled to be able to make this resource available, either for you, if you know Jesus, to be reminded of the wonderful story of how he welcomes that thief on the cross to join him this day in paradise, not because the thief had done anything to earn his salvation, but because of the work that Jesus was doing on the cross, even at that very time. But it's a wonderful resource, I think, to be able to share with those who don't yet have the hope of heaven because they don't know Jesus. And we want to be inviting others to receive that hope, to join us in heaven uh, through trusting in the Savior who came. And so we we hope that you'll be able to take hold of this resource and share it as well with those who might be glad to read it and receive it. Well, we want to send you a copy of this book, Heaven, How I Got Here, against the story of the thief on the cross. Our thank you for your financial support this month. 
You can give your gift online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Or again, our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.